You're listening to the Fierce Fatty Podcast, episode 59. Let's talk about sex, baby. Let's do it. Perfect. I'm Victoria Wellsby, TEDx speaker, best selling author, and fat activist. I have transformed my life from hating my body with desperately low self-esteem to being a courageous and confident, fierce fatty who loves every inch of this jelly. Society teaches us living in a fat body is bad, but what if we spent less time, money and energy on the pursuit of thinness and instead focused on the things that actually matter, like if pineapple on pizza should be outlawed, or if the mullet was the greatest haircut of the 20th century. So, how do you stop negative beliefs about your fat body controlling your life? It's the Fierce Fatty Podcast. Let's begin. Let's talk about sex, baby. Let's talk about you and me. Let's talk about the other persons that can be. Let's talk about sex. Let's talk about sex. Do you remember that song from the 90s? And that other song, oh, Right Said Fred. Do you remember that one? I'm too sexy for my shirt. Too sexy for my shirt. Too sexy it hurts. I remember that being on... Um, I might have been like Top of the Pops or something and my mum being there and me f- like just the word sex, me being like, oh, this is so embarrassing. Um, <laughs> yeah, so let's talk about fat sex today and things that go around fat sex. Um, I've been watching, re-watching Game of Thrones the HBO most watched TV show in history, I think. Anyway, I watched I watched season one when it first came out, but then I didn't watch lots of the seasons, and then I then I st- picked it up again at like season six or seven or five or something. Anyway, and so I was just like, Do you know what? I need to go back and watch it all because you know, because you know. And so I've been binging it. I've been binging it. Let me see where I'm at on season six. Oh my god. <laughs> I've watched six seasons of Game of Thrones in, um, hmm, I don't know, maybe a couple of weeks, a couple of days, a <laughs> couple of hours, who knows. Anyway, so uh, Game of Thrones, lots of uh, tits, right? Women's tits and not enough dicks. I saw I, there was a dick today. I saw a dick today. This, I saw a dick today. A, you know, but the rest of them they haven't been real. Anyway, and I just got it. Just got me thinking about tits, and as you do, just having a little think about tits. Um, all of the people in the show, the most of the people in the show in the show in leading roles are stereotypically attractive and um, there's this use of you know whapping out the baps uh, as a way to kind of make it you know it's like very violent you know sex and you know incest and all sorts of different things like that and so um yeah, but they but they don't have uh, knobs. They don't have knobs. It's not it's not uh, it's it's not fair. Um, and yeah, anyway, the tits that they show are um, stereotypically the tits that society tells us are good tits. So they're not, they're not saggy tits. They're not tits with inverted nipples. They're not tits that one goes one way, one goes the other. They're not tits where one's bigger than the other. They're not tits where. Uh, their teeny tiny tits, they're all stereotypically quote unquote attractive tits. And um, this is getting, I was getting, I'm getting annoyed with it. I'm getting annoyed with it. Um, 
And anyway, watching watching six seasons of Games of Thrones, it's not good for my mental health anyway, because there's lots of violence in it. I had a nightmare about beheading and um, yeah, and it just made me think about attractiveness and why is it that in the show, like the show has a fat phobia problem anyway, like the fat characters, there's a lot of like, oh, look at that one, he's fat and oh, look, he's so fat, he eats food and shit like that, which is, you know, boring. Um, but then sometimes the good characters are fat, but they're, it's kind of like they're fat, but at least they're kind of noble, you know, but they're not, they're not, they're not attractive and fat and good. They're not a main character who's fat and, and the savior, they're kind of quietly maybe good, but they're kind of making up for their fatness. Anyway, so this whole thing got me thinking about attractiveness and my view of attractiveness and um and being fat and my history of of fat sex having sex as a fat person and what that means and what fat people's attractiveness means in society and i've noticed um a difference in in my life after learning to love and accept my body and learning about fat politics um a difference in my sex life in my romantic life in my whole life basically my whole life some things have become harder but ultimately more rewarding you know setting boundaries and ending relationships making new relationships that's just hard right um but one of the things that, that took a while for me to see a clear difference in is sex and a couple of reasons um i were it was in long term relationships and and i don't know just didn't have the opportunity to have shit tons of sex very sad um and also i think this is a very sticky and tricky subject because our desirability is so tied up with our worth as human beings and being seen as desirable or sexually attractive seems to be, in society's terms, a very, very, very important quality. So the two areas I want to look at are the way that we perceive our own fat bodies and the way that uh, other people perceive our fat bodies. So other people, maybe our romantic partners, our fuck buddies, um, other people in society people that you're not maybe having sex with but um and I got I got kind of uh interested in this concept of fat not being a sexual preference after watching a video a year ago by the fat sex therapist um Sonali Rushatwa uh and uh Sonali made a video called fat phobia is not a sexual preference and what uh, Sonali says in this video I'm going to link to this video and all the other like articles and stuff that I mentioned in this video in the show notes you can find the show notes at fistfatty.com forward slash 059 for episode 59 if you ever forget which episode we're talking about and you want the show notes just go to forward slash podcast and you'll find them uh, so uh, Sonali says sexual orientations and sexual fetishes are not sexual preferences. Sexual preferences are not hardwired. They are really socially conditioned. We have some control of the fluidity of those preferences. Um, And also, don't hide behind the excuse of sexual preference. Name it for what it is, fat phobia. People are not hardwired to be never attracted to xyz people so fat people or black people or trans people or whatever people are not hardwired to not be attracted to to those people Um, society informs us of who uh, we should be attracted to and and where certain bodies falls on this hierarchy that society has created which is totally made up right I like to think about it, I always like to think about it as um, 
through the lens of art. I've mentioned before that I studied illustration at university and and one of the things that um, that really stuck with me is is what is art? And you know how some people are like, how can that be art? It's just a, you know, white square on a white background. That's not art. And it's like, well, yeah, it is because art is something that causes a reaction, even, you know, if it's negative or, or positive or whatever, that's causing a reaction with you. So then it's art, right? It doesn't matter if you don't like it. Um, and so it's all subjective. Someone else might come to this white square on a white background and say, oh my God, this is inspired. I need it. Incredible. And someone else is like, this is bullshit. And, um, and so there's no kind of police, art police that says this is art or this isn't art. And yes, like you can be more skilled in the art of mark making and, uh, making realistic depictions of things but anyway I always like to think about it like that so so um fat phobia is not a sexual preference watch this video from uh Sonali and uh it's 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 really interesting it's really interesting our preferences are not made in a vacuum society viewing fat bodies as an attractive you know I know that's not everyone but overall it's pretty agreed upon that smaller bodies are more attractive in society in general. And there's obviously lots of exceptions to that and lots of people who don't agree with that for many different reasons. So something that Caleb Luna says, uh, Caleb wrote, I'm going to link to this, uh, wrote, uh, treating my friends like lovers, the politics of desirability. Uh, I'm going to link to that. And what Caleb says is our desire and desirability is not just about who we do or want to have sex with or who or how often people want to have sex with us. It informs how we treat people in the larger world. So this is this is big stuff, right? You know, our desirability or how how much we think that people, other people find us attractive informs how we are treated in the world. Um, and if you are seen in society as more attractive or if you're seen as ugly, then um, you have more or less social capital. That makes sense? That makes sense? Um... Another thing that I want to share with you is uh, written uh, a piece written by Hari uh, Ziad and the piece is called Three Reasons Dating, Attraction and Desire Are Always Political. So in this article, a quote from Jamal T. Lewis, this is a quote from Jamal T. Lewis, desire is a cognitive and an emotional phenomenon informed by something. Let me repeat that. Desire is a cognitive and emotional phenomenon informed by something. Um, and then it continues. They explained in an interview with me, which is an assertion backed up by science. The article continues. For instance, in a study published in the Archives of Sexual Behaviour entitled is sexual racism really racism? The researchers found that racist attitudes were associated with racial slash sexual preferences, suggesting that racism informs sexual desires. And at the end of the, the piece, I'd argue that oppression's most effective tool is in systematically making marginalized individuals feel unworthy and deserving of their treatment so that they will be less inclined to fight. So society, the structure and the systems in society tell us that fat bodies are bad for a number of reasons and one of those ways that they are bad is they are not sexually attractive and so as a fat person we live in a society where on the whole our bodies uh, we're told that they're not attractive and so how does that affect us and how does that affect those who might date us or be with us or want to have sex with us or or be friends with us even um and, in, and the answer is, it, in a massive way, if you're a fat person and you've uh, 
been inclined to have sex and be in the dating world and stuff, I'm sure you've you've got examples of, you know, you've got stories to tell, I bet you. Now, this is an awesome uh, Vice art- article. I think uh, Marie Souther Despina wrote it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just at the top of my head. Um, yeah, so uh, the article... Again, I'm going to link it. Fat phobia exists and it's especially bad in the bedroom. So I'm going to uh, read a a little quote from this. It can also show up in the bedroom, um, quoting fat phobia in in life. And it, it can also show up in the bedroom. It can also show up in the bedroom. From the person I nearly hooked up with who asked, is it true that fat girls smell like cheeseburgers down there? To a dude who told my friend to guide him in because I don't think I'll be able to find it through the flab. There's no doubt that weight bias can penetrate even the most intimate of settings. Fat people have to navigate a dating pool that often feels saturated with folks who believe that they are, quote, uh, settling for us, unquote, who want to non-consensually fetishize our bodies or who assume we should be grateful for any attention we receive and abuse us because they believe it's their right to do so. Of course, plenty of fat people can and do have amazing, fulfilling, glorious sex and relationships eventually. I certainly did. Still, the, sto- the below stories provide prove that fat phobia doesn't discriminate when it comes to the places it'll show up. And then um, Marie shares stories that people have shared. One of the stories that really resonated with me, they're all like, holy shit, um, but one that resonate, re, res, resonated with me was from Rose38. Rose38 says, There was a guy I slept with, may have even dated him for a while, who told me fat girls are better in bed because they have nothing to offer a man. So they would go all the way. Like they would bend over backwards and do nasty things because they are ugly and no one wants them. They used to say because our thighs touch that we would have tighter vaginas, just making me feel like my only reason to exist was to pleasure someone. I was about 19 or 20 when this happened to me. I really felt quite worthless at that point. Like no matter what I liked or who I stood for, no one would see me for who I was. Instead, I would only be seen as a sexual object. Very early on, I learned that There were men who would sleep with me in secret, but never date me. And then I knew that my price to pay was to be easy. We truly deserve more. I wish I had learned earlier that all they wanted was just to use me, but it's okay. I learned from those experiences and I'll never go back. So that was from Rose 38 in the Vice article. That that really spoke to me about... It really resonated with me because it was like that's, you know, a lot of my personal experiences um, before learning that it's okay to be fat. So I always wanted to date people who were stereotypically attractive um, to, I believe that it would raise my attraction levels to be with someone who was stereotypically attractive and so I probably wouldn't have dated fat people I'm trying to think if I ever did yeah maybe a couple uh, but I would want to be they would have to be um showing to the world that they were attractive in other ways like you know maybe they were you know masculine so maybe they were tall and maybe they had a beard and maybe they etc etc so um I remember one time when I was 17 and I was getting off the school bus and my abuser boyfriend who was 30 was there waiting for me to meet me from school and one of my uh, school friends got off the bus and I was like oh look there's my boyfriend and he was like you're with him how did you get with him and instead of being offended that he thought that uh I was so ugly that I could get with someone who was conventionally attractive um I was like proud because it was like well yeah obviously I can get with someone like that because I'm amazing obviously I didn't think that but you know that's kind of like how I took it of of he was a trophy to me and even though he abused me in every way you know imaginable he was attractive so you know I was so lucky to be with him 
Um, and I accepted that he would say abusive things about my body because I believed them to be true. And so when he complained, saying, why do your tits look like that? Why do you have saggy tits? I would be like apologizing for my body. I want to go back right now and just like teleport and just go and punch him in the face. <laughs> so I would have sex with people way before I wanted to, to prove that I had value because I could please them and prove that someone wanted me. And I wanted them to fall in love with me because I had had sex with them. And it would mean that they had overlooked my fatness. But they did it because I had so much more to give because I was I was having sex with them. And this is a lesson I learned very young. So uh, in my neighborhood, there was a boy that, li that would come and visit his grandma. And he lives, he, his grandma lived opposite me, Daniel Oswin, my first boyfriend. And so I'd be his girlfriend, but also there was a girl that lived two doors behind him called Jenny Rogowski. Jenny was blonde and thin. And so he would swap between the two of us. <laughs> like, I mean, there was no other boy, I guess because there was no other boys our age um, around. <laughs> so he would like dump me and go out with her and then dump her and go out with me. And I would always say to him, Daniel, you know, I'll do more things with you than Jenny's. Jenny won't like kiss you because we were like kissing each other. So this is when I was like, I don't know, 10 yeah, about nine or ten, we would like kiss. And so to get him more and more interested, I would say, oh, um, let's try this new kiss that that the kids on the street were talking about. And it was like, you know, do the washing machine kiss where you like roll your tongue around each other's mouths and the, the rainbow kiss. Oh, my God, this is so disgusting. Skip ahead. 30 seconds if you don't want to hear something disgusting. But the rainbow kiss was when you would you would stand close to each other and then you would spit into each other's mouths and the, the rainbow bit would be like the spit going up into the air and then into their mouth and then the other would reciprocate. That would be the rainbow kiss. I'm telling you, I bet you some adult was like, uh, you know, some kid was like, what's kissing mean? And then <laughs> someone said, it means spitting into each other's mouths. And then some kid heard that and was like, this is what kissing is. And then kids did it, you know, that wasn't, I remember doing that and being like, oh, that's so disgusting. But you know, if I do it, then Daniel won't dump, dump me. He dumped me in the end. Who knows who he ended up with? Not, well, not me, obviously, and not Jenny Rogowski. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so with all partners, I believed that it was my job to sexually satisfy them and to avoid um, having to inconvenience them with my wants, needs and desires to the point of about 95% of the orgasms I had were fake. If a guy tried to pleasure me, one, I wouldn't be comfortable because I felt like I didn't deserve the pleasure because you know he was doing me a favor by having sex with me uh, two I believed that he was probably feeling disgusted that he was having to pleasure me and three I wanted them to believe that I was so easygoing and that I that I was so like a porn star that I would fake an or orgasm in like 2.5 seconds and so if a guy was like, if a guy was interested in uh, making sure that I had fun, I wouldn't let him because I'd be like, you know, he'd look at me and I'd be like, oh my God, I just had an orgasm. <laughs> and he'd be like, okay, <laughs> okay, well, that was easy. Um, and so it's kind of just contributed to this feedback loop of them thinking that they could make me come just by flopping their dick out. And I'd be like, oh my God, I just had an orgasm. And so then how hard would that be then for me to be like, oh, actually, no, you, um, you have to do stuff. <laughs> so I would constantly want to make up for the fact that, that they had a defective partner by doing stuff I didn't necessarily want to do or making myself hypersexual for them so you know buying lingerie and constantly shaving my legs and shaving my arsehole and 
going to sex classes to learn how to give great blow jobs and hand jobs and all sorts of things and being super feminine and trying to portray myself as, as as weak and as little as possible to try and be this kind of porn star type person to make up for the fact that they had to have sex with a fat person. Now, most of my boyfriends weren't, weren't like, oh my God, you're fat, it's gross, I guess I'll have to have sex with you. It was only really that first one who behaved like that and and um probably like some random guys in between who might have said comments and stuff like that that kind of reinforced it and society telling me constantly that being fat was really bad and these poor guys oh my god they're having to date these fat people oh terrible terrible life um to the point that i I would accept, so I was doing all this stuff, lingerie, shaved asshole, fucking bleached ear holes, like, you know, porn star hair, all that type of stuff. And in return, I would ex- uh, I would accept, like, a smelly dick, shit-stained underwear, and a couple of pumps, and be thankful for it. And be like, oh, you know, great sex life! <laughs> Yeah, like, he might have been covered in his own shit, but who cares? This is a thing. This is a thing. Have you heard about this? It's a thing. Oh, it's called chef's ass. If you don't want to hear something dis- disgusting... Do you know what? If you don't want to hear something disgusting, you should probably just not listen to any episodes. Of- <laughs> or this one in particular. Chef's ass, right? So there's this thing going around the... Not even going around, it's been around the cis het men that after they shit, they believe, some of them, believe that it would be gay to wipe their own ass, And it would be gay to wash their own ass in the shower. <laughs> this is a thing. Google it. Chef's ass. There's lots of message boards about it and men being like, yeah, well, why would I touch my asshole? Because I'm not gay. Oh. Uh. And, you know, I'm not touching my my asshole with soap. I'll just let water run over it, you know, and hope the shit might fall off. And there there was this, like, one woman on there who was like, "Uh, my boyfriend refuses to to wipe his ass. And uh, every time he comes over, he leaves shit stains in my bed. Um, If we have sex, it absolutely reeks of shit. Um, And I've spoken to him about it and he, he refuses or he says he forgets to wipe his ass and what can I do like he's a nice guy I don't want to break up with him but you know there's shit everywhere (laughs) and um yeah like I would I would accept that I would expect accept that shit literally because I'm like well (laughs) they're dealing with something as equivalently disgusting as shit my body which is not true by the way um the chef's ass is true, but <laughs> the rest of it isn't. Uh, so, so when I learn about fat positivity and fat activism and all that type of stuff, I started to, in in relationships, in, in, in sexual encounters, ask for more, and that was either confusing for them or annoying for them. The men I was picking anyway. So not all men are like this, obviously. But the types of men um, I might have been hooking up with, if they had said fat phobic things before we went to bed, bef- I wouldn't have been like, oh, sounds like he's a bit of fat phobe. I don't think I should get with him. I'd be like, well, you know, whatever. <laughs> he's right. Uh, so now... I tend to, I say tend to because um, sometimes it still happens, I tend to not get into a situation where I would have sex with a fat phobe or would have sex with someone who thinks that my body is less because it was it is fat. Um, because generally speaking, unless you like, you know, meet someone and you don't really talk and then you just have sex, generally speaking you can kind of get an idea about someone before you have sex. Not always. You know, sometimes people can be like, um, like the last guy I had sex with like a year ago. 
so depressing <sighs> i need some more dick this quarantine has really got me bad and i live in the middle of nowhere anyway so i ha so um i i had sex with this guy and um before i'm like he's a pretty normal reasonable guy and so this motherfucker this motherfucker so we, i so i went around his house right in the like i spent the evening during the evening i made him come three times i made him come three times he was like oh my god this is amazing my turn for an orgasm two minutes in he says hurry up <laughs> this motherfucker had his balls drained and two minutes of the focus being on me he's like oh gone haven't you come yet it's been like 12 seconds <laughs> like, and i was just like no 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 mate no um no thank you didn't see him again because i was like what the fuck before i would have just been like oh yeah oh yeah oh yeah just had an orgasm faked it because he would have been putting pressure on me to to perform or whatever um so uh Oh. So now, um, now understanding that there's two, the, you know, kind of like what we're talking about in this podcast, two things going on here, the two things being the way that we perceive our fat bodies and the way that society perceives our fat bodies. And the way that I view it now is that my fat body is not a problem. However, a lot of the people that I will encounter when pursuing uh, relationships think that my body is a problem and then that's a problem for me because I am not going to be with someone who thinks that my body is a problem who thinks oh you know I'll date her because you know like that like Rose had said oh maybe she's like great in bed because she's fat so she has to make up for being fat you know or whatever whatever they believe or maybe I'll just have sex with her but I won't be seen in public with her Maybe I'll just, uh, you know, I'll tell her that I want to pursue a relationship, but I don't. I'll just have sex and then see you later. Whatever it is. I, that's not okay with me. Like, that is, that's not okay. That's not okay for people to treat me like that. And people like that are out there. Absolutely. And unfortunately, most of the people who are in the dating world or the sex world or whatever it is, um, are biased have fat phobic beliefs like deeply fat phobic beliefs that they don't want to examine and and say oh it's just a preference it's just a preference and their preference is to non-consensually fetishize thin bodies to non-consensually fetishize thin bodies and like Sonali says just to not call it out and say yeah I'm a fat phobe yeah I'm just a fat phobe and genuinely genuinely think that they were born and their brain had uh this preference implanted in there that said I will never be attracted to a fat body no fat person on earth of all the billions of people out there not a single one could I ever possibly be attracted to like that's ridiculous <laughs> that's redonk and this is not about forcing people to um come and have sex with me like it's not about that it's about people examining their biases because we all have biases right so um so we've got that one side society but then also are we going to internalize this this myth that society has created this rating system this hierarchy of bodies that society has created that most people will never benefit from right so you know all these different shows or you know in society you say oh she's a 10 or how attractive are you in a scale of one to ten most people are not going to be rated a 10 right and so for everyone who is a nine and below that system is not good for them so why are we buying into this system? It's literally just made up. It's made up, right? We just said, okay, you know, in our society, we think this type of body, this amount of muscles on a man, this height on a man, this, this hair length on a woman, woman, this breast size on a woman, you know, this is optimal. But why? 
why it's like art remember it's like art it's it's subjective and so are we going to say yep that system that society has devised which benefits people who are already in power uh i'm gonna buy into that system and i agree with it 100 percent. and because of that i'm gonna accept less in my life nah don't like it nah not interested uh no thank you and that quote that one quote i'm gonna read it again from hari zayad uh, ziad i'd argue that oppression's most effective tool is in systematically making marginalized individuals feel unworthy and deserving of their treatment so they will be less inclined to fight it if we are beaten down because we think that our fat belly and our saggy tits and whatever else uh our fat bodies are bad and disgusting when someone says your body is bad and disgusting we will probably say yeah or say well that's not very nice but they're kind of they're kind of true versus telling them to fuck off which is what we should be doing you know and it's not it's not our fault right it's not it's not anyone's fault that we internalize this stuff and we believe it like it's not our job to um to change the world for for everyone be and because we are the ones who are suffering from this too right uh it's totally normal to have internalized these things because it's so pervasive it's everywhere like i'm saying on game of thrones i'm like jesus why can't we just get this princess who is fat and people are like oh she's so beautiful and it would be so amazing but they just don't do that and that's just one of a billion shows and um messages that is out there in society that says these bodies are sexually attractive and these bodies are not sexually attractive so where are you at with this how's it going for you are you uh having sex with people who are fat phobes are you with someone who's a fat phobe oh that would suck most people probably are because most people are fat you know really fat phobic um are you compensating in your relationships for your fat body are you able to say the way that, is, that society views fat bodies is fucked up and i'm not buying into it some questions for you have a little think in your brain in your amazing brain and uh if you want the links to all of the different articles that i spoke about in this episode go to fearsfatty.com forward slash zero five nine for the show notes or you could probably just look in the scroll down on your screen if you're watching listening to this on somewhere somewhere there'll be links okay so uh Thank you for hanging out with me today and talking about sex, baby. And I appreciate it. I appreciate you being here. And um, I hope you're getting lots of uh, sex and juicy orgasms if you want them. And no sex if you don't want it. And you're just feeling good. You're feeling good. All right. I'll see you in the next episode. See you later. Crocodile. Stay fierce, fatty. <laughs>